A muzzled media, corruption in government, and a silenced opposition. Many Malaysians are hoping those things are now behind them, with the ousting of Najib Razak from the Prime Minister's office four months ago. However, the country's new leader, Mahathir Mohamad, is no stranger to media censorship or corruption. Mahathir has already spent 22 years as Prime Minister and was known for locking up political opponents, shutting down newspapers and remoulding media legislation. But that was the old Mahathir, allegedly. This new one has pulled a U-turn in his approach to the media. News sites shut down by Najib are now back online, and Mahathir has repealed one of the more contentious laws passed by his predecessor, the Anti-Fake News Act. But many onlookers still wonder, understandably, if this new Mahathir won't turn out the same as the old one, given that much of the system he's talking about dismantling was built by him. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now on what Mahathir Mohamed's change of tune might mean for the Malaysian media. Mahathir Mohamed, the seventh Prime Minister of Malaysia, was also its fourth. In his first stint from 1981 to 2003, he gained a reputation as an autocrat. Uh, this time round, as he vowed in his campaign video, things will be different. Uh, Mahathir had shown that he's not the old Mahathir. And I think he's uh, constantly reminded of the fact that he had these 22 years of terror. He's the man of the moment. He's very popular. He is now someone who can do no wrong. It is clearly unpredictable. But what is important is that we would uh, judge him by, by his action. Not many people start a new job or change their politics at age 93. Mahathir did both. He left his own party to lead the opposition, partnering with a man that he'd put in prison, Anwar Ibrahim. And Mahathir made freedom of expression a big part of his election campaign. This is the same man that the Committee to Protect Journalists branded an enemy of the press back in 1999. The most uh, notorious thing that he did was Operation Lala, which happened in 1987. So these 100 over people were taken in and detained without trial. On top of that, at least three newspapers were suspended. It instilled in society the culture of fear. Over two decades in power, Mahathir introduced and tightened legislation to keep news outlets in check. There was the Printing Presses and Publication Act, which kept news outlets on their best behaviour by requiring them to reapply for their licence every year. The Official Secrets Act was broadened in scope and used to prosecute dissidents and journalists. Mahathir also introduced the Communications and Multimedia Act, which was later used to target the media and activists for content published online. Journalist Stephen Gann set up an independent news outlet in 1999. He remembers the legal hoops and requirements he had to go through. When we thought of setting up a, uh, an alternative you know, the, uh, media in Malaysia, it was difficult for us to actually a do print, there's no way that we could get a license. So the internet was our last resort. We were called traitors by Mahathir. Our office were raided by the police. Almost two dozen of our computers were taken away and they were not returned to us until about two years later. That was really an attempt to shut us down. I believe that the Prime Minister has changed. He has reformed, he has transformed. And we have promised that we are going to do away with some of the laws that are considered inhibiting press freedom and inhibiting the freedom of expression generally. So we are now not looking back, we are looking forward. The rehabilitation of Mahathir's image is the accidental legacy of the previous Prime Minister, Najib Razak, a former protégé of Mahathir's. In 2015, Najib was found to have been at the center of a global corruption scandal involving the state development fund, One Malaysia Development Berhad, known as 1MDB. 
Under Najib's watch, the fund lost $4.5 billion through shell companies and opaque transactions that spread across 10 countries. 681 million of that, according to US prosecutors, was found in Najib's personal bank account. Once the 1MDB scandal hit the headlines, Najib made use of the repressive laws that he'd inherited, and he came up with one of his own, the Anti-Fake News Act. That whole fake news is connected to the whole 1MDB scandal or any other corruption cases that involves the government. So basically what they're trying to say is that don't believe anything that you see on the internet unless we say so or unless we sanction. So this whole fake news thing was basically the last act that Najib had put out there just before the elections uh, to try to scare people. The government tried to, you know, to, uh, to use the anti-fake news law against Mahathir during the election campaign. Uh, Mahathir was claiming that there was an attempt to stop him from actually putting his uh, nomination papers in time. And the fact that he's repealed this anti-fake news law, uh, it shows that, you know, that, that he's taking the step uh, in the right direction. Mahathir did away with the Anti-Fake News Act last month, but there are other laws. The Sedition Act, introduced under British colonial rule back in 1948, still remains in effect. The definition of sedition under that law is extremely broad, and in 2015 alone, Najib used the law 91 times, almost five times as often as during the first 50 years of the law's existence. One of the people accused under that law was a cartoonist, Zuna. Zuna has always had trouble publishing his work. During Mahathir's previous time in office, none of the major newspapers would dare hire him. But over the last 10 years, Zunar found that he didn't need publishers. He self-published on social media and highlighted the corruption of Najib and Najib's wife, Rosma, whose many luxury handbags and diamonds were a gift to satirical cartoonists. That didn't go down well. Zunar was charged with sedition nine times and banned from leaving the country. When the new government came into power, I found out that my travel ban had been lifted. They also dropped all the sedition charges against me. Uh, thank you very much for that. But uh, I think this is still not enough. So the interpretation is very, very big and anybody can be victim of it. Uh, you draw a cartoon, sedition. Somebody write something, sedition. If you do some speech, it's seditious. What the government need to do is to abolish the sedition as at all. In the months after the election, Malaysia and Mahathir experienced a sort of honeymoon period. They came together to oppose Najib, whose trial date has been set with full media access, despite Najib's request for a gag order. However, Mahathir's campaign promise to review all repressive media regulation remains unfulfilled, and in August, Mahathir announced that the Official Secrets Act is here to stay. There are other things that he needs to do in order to uh, redeem himself. He needs to bring back the independence of the judiciary so that we have a real democracy. The judiciary has been emasculated and it was done by him in those days. It would be a real test of his sincerity to, to give it back its independence. I think uh, uh, he's redeeming himself. He has allowed people to debate on so many issues and you can see columns and articles written uh, questioning him, insulting him or criticizing him and uh, we haven't seen anyone you know, complaining that he's been told to uh, snip it or zip up. So far, not yet. Yeah, this is Mahadev. I portray him like a crocodile. He destroy every institution in Malaysia. So Malaysian people, they have to play a very active role now to strengthen the institution. You have to understand before, Mahathir is a dictator. And we don't change dictator. And dictator doesn't change. 